My name is John McKeon. I'm the moderator of the Teradata of Primo River, and today we have with us Peter Fader. He is a professor of marketing and co-director of the Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative at Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Peter, it's good to have you here. Great to talk to you, John. Peter, it was an interesting talk you gave at the eMetrics conference last week. And what you were really talking about is your new book, Customer Centricity. There has been a lot of work on customer centricity over the years, maybe even decades. What role does this book have relative to the work that's gone before it? I'm hoping that this book will bring some clarity to how people view customer centricity, to what it actually is, to the kinds of firms that are engaged in it, the kinds of activities that need to go on in order for a firm to really claim such a label for itself. There's been just a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstandings, and in some cases, direct contradictions about what customer centricity is or isn't. So, Peter, what is customer centricity? Very often I find it best to to define it by what it isn't. (laughs) And it's not a singular focus on customer service, that the customer is always right, that the customer is at the center of everything that we do, You'll hear these kinds of words from many experts and from many companies, and I think that that is partially true. Those kinds of things, putting the customer totally at the focus of everything we do, should be true for the really good customers, which unfortunately are always a minority of the customers in your customer base. So the question is, who are the really good ones, who are the not-so-good ones, and how do you treat them differently from each other? That's what customer centricity is all about, is recognizing the vast differences across them and then picking and choosing and wrapping yourselves around the right ones. Well, Peter, I can be customer-centric all day long, but unless I have a company with four or five customers, it doesn't cut it. It needs a whole bunch of data. Tell me about that. Well, you're absolutely right. In, in any setting, we only have four or five customers. Let's say private wealth management or some very large industrial setting. Then you're automatically customer-centric because you're going to be thinking about all the wants and needs that your customers have, not only with respect to the products and services you sell, but other products and services or other activities that you can do to show your customer that you are a trusted advisor, that you have their best interests in mind, and that you're willing to sell them completely unrelated kinds of things or give them advice about competing products and services in order to win their trust. And I think some of those activities can take place even when you have thousands, if not millions, of customers. It's about figuring out who who are the customers that really deserve that level of attention and then using the behavioral data that you have about them, previous transactions, other kinds of touch points with them, to try to anticipate future wants and needs that they have. And you can't do that for everybody. Well, Peter, what is the point of actually doing the data thing if a lot of companies are aggregating and summarizing the results? Where do you get the level of precision that really allows you to execute on this? Well, that's exactly the problem. Most companies are over-aggregating their data, They're rolling it all up, and they're making very, very aggregate statements about sales or about different kinds of marketing activities and getting rough correlations between the two and therefore getting some perhaps misleading sense of what's working and what's not working. Then at the other extreme, there's companies that that claim to be doing one-to-one marketing. Let's bring it all the way down to a unique message for each different customer, and that's going too far. So a lot of the science is figuring out that the just right level between them how many segments should we have? How large should they be? And more importantly, what should be the basis that we use to segment the customers? And I think that's where the action is and where many companies are getting it wrong. Well, so Peter, I'm going to go after this holy grail of having the perfect balance between getting the right message at the right place, at the right level of precision. But what are the three alligators, if you will, that I'm going to probably run into in doing this? So as far as the operational issues, that will be a problem? Both operational and data issues. 
there's a number of, of issues that are going to arise, both operational issues and data issues. First and foremost, you have to be able to get the data at a sufficiently granular level. You have to be able to track individual customers over time in order to understand which segment or which bucket they're in so you have a sense of which kind of message would appeal to them. In many cases, that's really hard to do. There's technological limitations. There might be legal or ethical issues that prohibit companies from being able to track at a very granular level. In many cases, you'll have a very strong intermediary between you and what you deem as your customer, so you can't track their every move. So there's going to be data issues like that, and then there'll be analytical issues. How do you actually make sense of all that data? How do you organize it? Uh, how do you draw inferences from it? How do you build predictive models on it? And then there's going to be organizational issues as well, that if you have a very typical product-centric organizational structure, you're not necessarily going to have the right incentives or resources to be able to dive into the data and sort out the customers as well as you really need to. Well, Peter, I think below the organizational issue is also process issues. By definition, if an organization moves from an aggregated level to a detail level, you have to fundamentally change tried and true and trusted processes. How do you do that in an organization? That is correct. And I can't really answer the how do you do it. I'm a data-driven marketer, not a, an organizational design person. But I can point out the need to do it. And I can point out as I do in the book, a number of reasons why in a typical company you would be fired for following through on, on true customer-centric thinking. So things like selecting some customers instead of others. In many cases, you just can't do that. We treat all our customers well. The idea of using longer-term performance metrics and incentives, the idea that we might actually lose some money on this particular customer today because that's going to help us deepen and strengthen the relationship. So there's a number of things that you have to be able to do, whether it's the kind of data you collect, the structure of the organization, the directions that you give to the R&D people that just don't work in a traditional company if you want to be customer-centric. Well, Peter, where does the energy come from for this change? Is this a, a grassroots thing, or is this an executive passion? It needs to be both. It absolutely needs to be both. And unfortunately, it often starts and stops at the grassroots level. So you'll have the lone wolf analyst within the company who's actually looking through the data and recognizing some of the suboptimal things that the company is doing, but then is, is basically ignored by people at the higher level because, A, it, it, there's just certain ways that a company operates, and, B, the steps that would be needed to make those changes just aren't in the company's DNA. I think a lot of the problems lie with senior executives, and in particular with a chief marketing officer who in many cases just doesn't understand the analytics and the needs around them and therefore basically feels threatened by the steps that would be required to become truly customer-centric. And that's why it, it often goes no further. Well, Peter, what happens if in their gut this organization believes that they are good at this stuff? What do you do then? Well, that situation only arises when a company has its back to the wall. So you look at companies that couldn't find a path to success through the traditional product-centric approach. So a really great example would be uh, Harris Casino, which is one of the wonderful success stories of customer centricity. They just couldn't compete with a larger casino chain who just had m much more resources. And so they felt that the only way out is to wrap themselves around the high-value customers and bring in all the analytics to completely redefine the organization. So they did it more or less because they had to, as opposed to someone saying, hey, let's try this. Because in most cases, if a company's doing pretty well already, moving to customer centricity is actually a very, very risky thing to do. It's expensive. It's a completely different structure and set of incentives. And there's no guarantee that it's going to work. So for most companies, the best I can hope for is that they'll do itty-bitty little experiments. They'll dip their toes in the water just to get a sense of what it's all about and whether it might work for them. But a CEO coming down and saying, we're moving in this other direction, is unlikely to happen and unlikely to be successful. Peter Fader, professor of marketing and co-director of Wharton's Customer Analytics Initiative. Great 
insight into this and his new book, Customer Centricity, is a, is a must read. Peter, thank you so much. Thanks, John. Terrific talking to you.